Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has condemned a phone call between German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Russia's President Vladimir Putin. During an hour-long conversation, their first in nearly two years, Scholz told Putin to end the war and stressed German support for Ukraine. But Kiev says the talks with Putin always lead nowhere. On the phone with Putin for the first time in nearly two years, the German government said that Scholz told his Russian counterpart to stop his war on Ukraine and start talks with Kyiv. But according to Moscow, Putin was clear that any negotiations would have to reflect Russia's gains on the battlefield. Despite their disagreements, the Kremlin welcomed the call, saying that any dialogue at all was a positive development. In Kyiv, however, Scholz's action was quickly condemned. Olaf's call, in my opinion, opens Pandora's box. Now, there may be other conversations, other calls, just a lot of words. And this is exactly what Putin has long wanted. It's extremely important for him to reduce his isolation, Russia's isolation. The timing of the call, just days after Scholz's coalition government collapsed, has some saying it was politically motivated. This is about uh, Olaf Scholz still signalling to the German public that he's still in charge, he's still Chancellor, even if he's a lame duck. And it seems as though the main purpose was really to signal to the German electorate. More Germans have been questioning Germany's support for Kyiv, with the economy struggling and Ukraine on the back foot on the battlefield. Thousands turned out for this Berlin rally against weapons deliveries last month. Until now, German aid to Ukraine has been substantial, with only the US providing more. With snap elections now set for February and Scholz's Social Democrats headed for defeat, the Chancellor may be hoping that his new willingness to talk to Putin will win back voters. Well, for more, we're joined by DW's Russia analyst Konstantin Eger. Good to see you, Konstantin. The Kremlin has welcomed this call. How does it benefit Vladimir Putin? Well, it is a positive development for him. It uh, presents him not as an international pariah, but as an indispensable player to whom, to whom eventually everyone will have to talk. And the fact that it, uh, this call comes from the uh, Chancellor of Germany, uh, Europe's biggest country, one of the biggest economies in the G7, and as was rightly mentioned by Ben Dorman in the report, uh, the second largest supplier of weapons to Ukraine. Of course, this is a great boost of, if you wish, prestige uh, uh, and international standing for Putin. I, I don't think he believes he's locked today. And what about Ukraine's president, uh, Vladimir Zelensky? Can Scholter's overture be framed as anything other than a blow for Kyiv? Well, I think uh, it was mentioned that uh, Scholz called Zelensky in advance and said that he intends to speak to Putin. I think preliminary, uh, uh, preliminary caution from the Ukrainian president was that, I mean, with Putin, I think I'm quoting him, not about him, but very close to, 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 to the original. Uh, you only get lies from Putin and that's a chance for him to, you know, repeat his lies. That was what Zelensky, at least that was what was publicly revealed by Kiev, uh, said to Scholz. Uh, but it seems that uh, the German chancellor tried to sort of maintain this diplomatic politeness and warn Zelensky that he's going to call. But of course, we've seen the reaction is very negative, uh, also against the backdrop of the very uncertain situation with the incoming American administration. Uh, of course, Zelensky can't be happy with this call. I guess to the, the cynical view, uh, hard to ignore though, with early elections looming for Schultz, the timing of this call does appear political. Is there strategic reasoning for reaching out to Russia right now? I think there is no big strategic reasoning, but if, if, if you look at the situation, he could have called three months ago, he probably can call three months later. I mean, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not only about the situation on the battlefield, this is about creating a certain political framework uh, of isolation around the Kremlin, around Putin's regime in Russia. So in this respect, I understand why Zelensky was dissatisfied, but uh, as you rightly said, uh, German domestic political pressures seem to be very, very high, especially with the party of Sarah Wagenknecht uh, gaining a lot of votes on this kind of quote-unquote P3 
peace message, a peace at any cost. Uh, it seems like it, it seems well out of Germany, at least looking from 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 outside Germany, that this is exactly what Scholz is doing. He's trying to gain this uh, pacifist, uh, uh, rather left leaning electorate, which does exist in Germany, and that's why this uh, conversation. So Zelensky has been fighting against this for, for some time. How do you see this call impacting Ukraine's relations with Berlin and, and other European partners going forward from this point? Well, judging by what we know uh, publicly about the uh, situation, political situation in Kiev, uh, Zelensky is much more focused now on dealing with the uh, incoming U.S. administration of Donald Trump. Uh, but also, of course, uh, the predictions are that uh, there's going to be a government change in Germany. And uh, I think that this call, I suspect, let's put it like that, that this call will make Zelensky think less about conversing with Scholz and probably looking forward to, de forward to dealing with the new coalition in Germany. Uh, but again, we don't know how the elections will end. But definitely my suspicion is that this will sour personal relations between Zelensky and Scholz because Zelensky will see that Scholz has been basically using Ukraine for his domestic uh, political goals. DW's Russia analyst, Konstantin Egert, thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, for more, I'm joined by DW correspondent Rebecca Ritters in Kiev and our political correspondent Julia Sardelli, who's in Wiesbaden today. Rebecca, I'll start with you. Uh, how big a blow is Chancellor Scholz's call to President Putin for Ukraine? Well, it certainly wasn't welcomed here in Kiev, as you heard in that report, Anthony. You know, Volodymyr Zelensky, President Volodymyr Zelensky, really lashing out at the, the decision by Olaf Scholz to make that call to uh, President Putin of Ukraine. Uh, in fact, we're even hearing reports that he actually called uh, Olaf Scholz before the call, urging him not to do it. Of course, it then uh, went ahead and he used his evening address to, to lash out, saying that this was only playing in the hands of Putin, opening Pandora's box, as you heard there in that report. And that this would really pave the way for Putin to you know, come back in from the cold, from this international isolation uh, and, you know, pave the way for more Western uh, communication with Vladimir Putin, something that, you know, is very welcomed, as you also heard in that report by Vladimir Putin, and certainly uh, something that isn't seen as a positive here in Kyiv. Uh, President Zelensky saying that this wouldn't lead to a Minsk III, referring to these, uh, you know, attempted peace agreements, Minsk I and Minsk II, uh, around about 10 years years ago, uh, certainly sharply criticising. And we also heard from the foreign ministry here echoing those words, saying that there really wasn't anything in the call other than what we uh, already know, that there wasn't any policy changes by Germany uh, and that it, this would just be leading the way for uh, bringing Putin away from isolation. So certainly seen as more of a domestic thing here, as you heard there. Uh, that's the analysis and it certainly felt here that this was more of a domestic move by Olaf Scholz. Right then, Julia Sardelli, the, the view from Germany, the timing of Scholz's call is being read as political with early elections looming for Germany. What do you think Scholz was hoping to achieve here? Well, I think on the one side, if we look at the global political context and the re-election of Donald Trump as U.S. president, one could think that uh, Scholz may have wanted to show leadership as uh, Ukraine's second biggest supporter after the U.S. And with uh, Donald Trump possibly uh, threatening to reduce or just generally cut support for Ukraine and uh, possibly wanting to push for a quick uh, peace between Russia and Ukraine, regardless of the price that that would mean for Ukraine itself, this might be Scholz uh, wanting to uh, try to steer the conversation, try to steer uh, the possible negotiations to try to support Ukraine more. But on the other hand, obviously, there are also internal German considerations to take into account, given that we're uh, going to go for elections in three months. And on the one hand, we see German Chancellor Olaf Scholz trying to appease parts of the German public that uh, do not want to support Ukraine, do not uh, want this war uh, to continue. And these are people that are currently being reached by parties like the far-right AFD or the Sarah Wagenknecht Alliance. On the other hand, he's also trying to reach some people within his party, the Social Democrats, who are also not particularly supportive of uh, more support for Ukraine, are skeptical about the war continuing uh, for a long time, uh, looking ahead at, at these elections that are going to be very important for the Chancellor and his party.
Rebecca Schultz's overture to Putin comes days after US President-elect Trump called Zelensky. How hopeful are officials in Kyiv that the incoming US administration will maintain its support? Well, there seems to be two major perspectives and two camps, if you will. One globally, but also here in Ukraine, I should add. And that is really one, of course, fears that a Trump administration could see a forced capitulation for Ukraine. It could uh, force Ukraine to the negotiating table at a massive disadvantage if the US were to simply pull its support for Ukraine. But there's a growing uh, camp or perspective here, and one that Volodymyr Zelensky seems to be subscribing to, and that is that a Trump presidency or the Trump uh, administration in the White House could see uh, a faster end to this war, which is, of course, what everyone here is, is wanting. They don't want to give up territory, of course, but they do want to see an end to the war, as certainly as they're increasingly struggling uh, on the battlefield and, and losing to Russia as they increasingly uh, come forward in this war. So certainly Volodymyr Zelensky has even made comments just yesterday to local media saying uh, that he, he welcomes the, uh, you know, this Trump presidency that, that he, it would p potentially see a faster end to this war than what we've been seeing with the Biden administration. People here increasingly frustrated with how the Biden administration has been conducting in the war, not allowing long-range uh, weapon use inside Moscow and that it's really just creating a stalemate. So we are seeing uh, also uh, Volodymyr Zelensky saying that he'll be meeting Trump after the inauguration. So uh, certainly a, a growing perspective there that this could be a positive thing for the war. Julia, you're at the gathering of Germany's Greens Party, which was traditionally pacifist, but its leaders have been strong backers of Ukraine. Uh, is there still that strong commitment heading into what looked like early elections? Yes, indeed, we've heard that yesterday in the first day of the party congress from two of the most visible green politicians who are also ministers in the current government, Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock and uh, Vice Chancellor Robert Habeck. Both of them reiterated the strong commitment of the Green Party uh, for Ukraine. We heard from Baerbock, she called for further support for Ukraine and she said that in the context now of uh, further talks of possible negotiations, that a, a durable, and just peace is more important than the absence of war for Ukraine. And we also heard from Robert Habeck. He said that it is Germany's duty. It owes it to Ukraine to continue to support him. And he did say that the Green Party is the party of peace, but it is also the party of freedom, a point that uh, was quite uh, resounding. It resounded quite a lot with people here in, in the hall at the Green Party Congress. Julia Saudelli in Wiesbaden and Rebecca Ritters in Kiev. Thanks to both of you.